So Prabhupada compared the materialist with Ravana. Uh, Ravana wanted Lakshmi, Sita Devi, non-different, uh, but he didn't want Ram. You understand? So this is a very appropriate comparison. Of course, we know that Ravana never got Sita Devi. Ravana got Maya Sita, right? Uh, the real Sita Devi was taken by Agni and kept uh, very safe. And the Maya, the Chaya, the reflection of Sita Devi, was actually taken uh, by the Ravana. Because actually Prabhupada explains that if Ravana had touched the real Sita Devi, he would have died immediately. There would have been no need for Ramchandra to kill him. So Sita Devi could have killed him. Not, not that even she wanted to, just by touching her, he would have died immediately. So anyway, so Sita Devi cannot be had or you cannot have the mercy of Lakshmi without Narayan. You get Durga, and Durga means basically to move with great difficulty. Even though it's interesting, in Bengal they have Durga Puja, isn't it? And Durga Puja, don't they understand what Durga, the name Durga means? Don't they never think about it? I mean, it's really amazing. People never think about the meaning of words. Durga means to, it looks like the prison warden, you know, the person who ties you up. And do they ever think of why she carries the trident, the adhyatmic, adibodhik, and adidavik? No, they don't think about that. They just worship her. Anyway, but there's a very interesting story uh, that uh, Radharani, of course, uh, there's this place um, called Gori Kund, right near Govardhan. And Radharani would sometimes go there to worship Durga. Hmm. And, of course, when she went there to worship Durga, Krishna was also there. So, but she told her family that she was going to worship Durga. So she went there to worship Durga, and, of course, Krishna was there. But her husband was right, what do they say, hot on her heels. He was just, like, following her there, along with his wonderful uh, mother and sister, uh, Jatila and Kutila. Anyway, because they had suspected something all along that Krishna was having a, an affair with Radharani. <laughs> and so they, they were getting ready to actually kick Radharani out of Vrindavan and send her to Mathura for safekeeping. So anyway, so, so they got there and uh, the gopis, they warned Krishna, ah, Abhimanyu, Jatila, Kutila, they're coming. And so Krishna thought, you know, what can I do? Krishna was in anxiety. So he took on the form of Durga eight arm form. And so when uh, Abhimanyu Jatila Kutila arrived there, Radharani was worshipping Krishna, but it was actually looked like Durga. She was offering obeisances, and they arrived there, and they said, oh, it's nice, you're worshipping Durga. Durga's actually came out, come out of the deities. Isn't that wonderful? And then Durga began to speak. It was Krishna, of course. And Durga said, Krishna said, uh, Krishna Vacha, he said, Abhimanyu uh, is going to die tomorrow. Kamsa and his soldiers are going to come and chop his head off. And, and uh, Jatila, they start, all started to beg at Durga, Krishna's feet, and say, Krishna, or not Durga, Krishna, Durga, forgive us, forgive us, please. And Durga said, there's nothing you can do about it. Forget it. He's going to die. Finished. You know, boss. And they begged, is there anything, is there anything we could do? Why are we suffering? And Durga said, you're suffering because you wanted to send Radharani out of Vrindavan and didn't trust her chastity. She's the most chaste person. So the real way you can get out of this is if you take a vow never to send her out of Vrindavan and also take a vow never to doubt her chastity. And so they all said, yes, we'll never doubt her again, never doubt her again. And Krishna, as Durga said, yes, then you won't die, we bless you. And then they left, and Krishna and Radharani went on with their pastimes. So anyway, 
So, anyway, just a little story about Durga. So that's good, Durga Puja. <laughs> that you can do in Bengal. Uh, so anyway, so getting on with the story is that uh, you get Durga, you get misery if you worship Durga uh, without, or Lakshmi actually, without Narayan. So anyway, so that's one point. So uh, Ravana, he got misery. We understand that. So the Sita's appearance is quite interesting. Of course, Sita, Lakshmi is eternally associated with Narayan. Whenever Narayan comes down, uh, Lakshmi comes too. And he comes with all of his associates and energies, Brasha Shakti, Vividaya Vishwi Tesh, Bhavabhaki Gyana Balakriya Cha. So he comes down, just like when Krishna appeared, Radharani came down. But the interesting thing is that Lakshmi, or Radharani, who is the original Adi Lakshmi, does not want to look at anyone else or consider even for a second anyone else but Narayan or Krishna as her husband. I mean, this is the most chaste personality. So just like when Radharani appeared, because she didn't want to see anyone else, uh, she appeared and she was blind when she first came down. You know, she appeared on a lotus flower too, just like Sita Devi. So she was completely blind and her family, you know, Rishabhana was all upset and everything like that. But Narada Muni said, still do, you know, do the sacrifice for her name giving and invite Krishna to come. <laughs> or Mother showed it and she brought Krishna. And so they brought Krishna uh, to the name giving sacrifice and then Krishna and Radharani crawled up on the lap of Mother Yashoda or Kirtida. And uh, then Radharani smelled Krishna and she opened her eyes for the first time. That's real chastity. That a wife doesn't want to see anyone else but her husband. Do you have any wives like that nowadays? No. You know, blind otherwise. Anyway, so, interesting. That's why women are more intelligent. Anyway, so... <laughs> in the men, they just have eyes open for everybody. Anyway. So... Uh, I just want to add that because I know they were upset or something about women being more intelligent. But anyway, so so uh, when Sita Devi appeared, it was a very similar type of thing. She wasn't blind, of course. But she first came down as his personality known as Vedavati. And she was meditating on Narayan from her very birth and she was performing harsh austerities on the top of a mountain in order to have Narayan as her husband. You know, she, had, she was just completely devoted. Hmm. And so, actually, it's a little similar to that story in Vrindavan of uh, Mirabai. Mirabai? You ever heard of Mirabai? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've heard of Mirabai. When Mirabai was young, you know, she was real young, she asked her parents, who's going to be my husband when I get older? And her parents just jokingly said, what? Krishna. And they gave her a Krishna deed, and she took it seriously. And then, you know, even later on, when they did get her married, you know, she doesn't, wasn't very attentive to her husband. And they all thought that she was hanging around with some other man. Her husband rushed in one day real angry. You know the story? It was really interesting. Her husband was real angry. She thought, he thought he, would, he was going to find her with another man. So he rushed into the house. <laughs> and she just found him worshipping Krishna. <laughs> he just found her worshipping Krishna. Anyway, so... So that, that's real chastity. So Vedavati, she was also uh, completely devoted. She was Sita Devi. But then as she was on the mountain worshipping Narayan, hoping to get Narayan as the husband, uh, this uh, airplane, 747, with, with Ravana, <laughs> actually was a pushback of Vimana, better than a 747, better than an A380, uh, came by, and Ravana had stolen this pushback of a Vimana from Kuvera, his brother. So he came by and Ravana looked down and he said, Wow, she is beautiful. And he just landed the plane. And he got out and said, Hello there, to her. And he said, What are you doing? And she said, I'm meditating on Lord Narayan as my husband. And he said, Well, look, I got someone better. Me. And she said, no, <laughs> you're ugly. And anyway, no, she didn't say that. But anyway, she said, no way, I'm devoted to Lord Narayan. And so he grabbed her by the hair, 
to try to drag her to the chariot, and she made her hand like a knife blade. And she cut the hair, cut her own hair, you know, like that. And she just began to immolate herself, to burn herself in a fire, sacred fire, yogic fire. And she said to Ravana that I'm going to be reborn in your kingdom and be the cause of your death. And so, poof, she went to ashes. And Ravana thought, yeah, there's no problem. No problem. I can take care of this. It's not going to influence me at all. So anyway, Ravana was going about his Ravana business uh, in Lanka. And then one day, in a pond, a uh, little baby girl appeared in a lotus flower. And he said, uh-oh, maybe that's the girl. He got real nervous when he saw her. And then he said to his associates, take her and throw her in the ocean and kill her. So they took this little baby girl and then they threw her in the ocean. And of course in the ocean you have Varuna, the ocean god. He picked her up, carried her very, very nicely and uh, gave her to Bhumi, the earth goddess. You know the earth goddess? Bhumi. And Bhumi took her under the earth, put her in a little, little box like that and brought her up to where Janaka Maharaj was having this sacrifice, you know, plowing the land. Because for rain, he needed rain or something like that. So he was plowing the land, and then the tip of the plow hit this box. That's why she's called Sita, you know, the plow. The tip of the plow hit the box. He opened it up and found a little baby girl inside. And that was Sita Devi. Pretty interesting. Janaka also has a very interesting history, too. Mm. Uh, all the kings in his dynasty were named Janaka. Did you know that? Because the original person in his dynasty was named King Nimi. King Nimi had a few problems with his guru. His guru's name was Vashishta Muni. And he offended his guru by performing a sacrifice while his guru was out getting guru dakshin <laughs> in the heavenly planets. You know, just because the, the uh, demigods pay more money than the earth people do. That might be a good idea if you want to collect for that school to go over to, <laughs> now that I think about it. <laughs> you know, do you have any contacts with the demigods? You know, like Indra, Varuna? I would like to go up there. Yeah, that would be a great fundraiser. Anyway, so <laughs> think of mountains of gold. Uh, anyway, so uh, then I'd be known as Haranya. Haranya means gold. Anyway, <laughs> Haranya Maharaj. Anyway, so <laughs> so so anyway, so uh, he anyway uh, Maharaj Nimi was cursed by Vashishta. You become near Deha, you die. Vashishta left his body, but his body was preserved by the sages. And then uh, at the same time, Maharaj Nimi cursed Vashishta to die. And so they both, the guru died and the disciple died. That was Guru Dakshin. That's nice Guru Dakshin, kill your guru. Anyway, so they both died. Uh, Vashishta Muni appeared later on from the uh, Semit of Mitra and Varuna. And Maharaj Nimi, he was sort of brought back to life at the end of the sacrifice but he didn't want to come back to life. He actually wanted to go back to Godhead. So he said, you know, don't bring me back to life. I'm getting the hell out of here. And so <laughs> what they did is after that, they churned his body and they produced the first Janaka, which means, you know, actually coming from the body, miti, maita, maitya, which means to churn. So they churned. So, they, so that's why the city is called Matila, which means the churning city. It's from maiti. You understand? So they, they churned his body, you know, genetic engineering or something like that. And then they, see, they're expert. You think you're so expert, doctor. You're very proud of your doctor expertise. But then they can actually take genes or churn the body. You can't do that. You can't clone a body. Isn't it? So they can cure diseases, cancer. They didn't need oncologists in those days. So they, anyway, so they... Turned the body, and the first Janaka was born, that's Janaka the first, then was Janaka the second, Janaka the third, Janaka the fourth, fifth, you know, and all the way up to the Janaka who was the father of Sita Devi. It's interesting. Anyway, so, so Sita Devi was brought up, but Janaka is also one of the Dwarasa Mahajanas. He's one of the 12 great personalities that are authorities on the Vedic literature. 
So he was brought, she was brought up in that kingdom and uh, there was actually this bow of Lord Shiva that was there. Uh, that Lord Shiva, of course, is known as uh, Tripurari because he killed this demon, you know, who was flying all over the world with his bow. Anyway, so the bow was given and this bow was so heavy it took like hundreds of people just to roll it. You know, not even to pick it up. Nobody could pick it up. Just to roll it with wheels, you know. You had all the king's soldiers and all the king's men. <laughs> like Humpty Dumpty. Anyway, so <laughs> all the king's soldiers and all the king's men, they would actually pull on ropes and gradually the bow would actually move a little bit. And the bow was kept in the deity worship room. And so what happened is that one time, like Sita David, she was playing with some sort of ball and she had to get the ball. And she thought, well, there's no stick to actually get the ball because it was stuck up in the air or something like that. And so she saw the bow and she picked up the bow very, you know, with her hand and picked it up like that. And then knocked the ball down and then went on playing. And but some of the soldiers said that, saw that. And they went to King Janaka and they said, uh, guess what, King Janaka? Uh, little Sita Devi has picked up this bow. And Janaka said, what have you been smoking? <laughs> it's not possible, you know. <laughs> you know, you, have you been... Uh, Anyway, taking drugs or something like that. So, uh, no, they said, come, come, come. And, you know, the bow was actually changed position. She had put it down by then. And then they understood that she had actually picked up the bow. And then he realized that she was a great personality. And uh, the test for her swine bar would be that whoever could pick up the bow and string it could actually win her hand. And, of course, it was impossible to do it. So uh, then many, many great uh, personalities would come for the Swayamvara. Even Ravana came, there's some description like that. And they couldn't even pick up the bow. I mean, it was just useless. What to speak of stringing it. And then finally, of course, uh, Ram came. Uh, Hare Krishna. Oh, she's chanting Japa. Very nice. <laughs> he's become very detached. <laughs> he looks like a very detached personality. So, uh, so Ram uh, just saved this lady Ahalya, because this Ahalya had been, had been cursed by her husband, go to Marishi. Anyway, that's another story. I'm not going to tell that. He just come, he, he came with with uh, Vishwamitra Muni after he had you know taken care of all the demons and everything like that, the sacrifice, and saved Ahalya who had been cursed by to go to Marishi and brought her back to life. Okay, and then uh, he entered into the Swayambara and then Ram after some time being told by Vishwamitra Muni picked up the bow very very easily without any problem went to string it and the bow broke and so it was just like huh what's going on here So, so everybody was wondering what's going on. Later on, he got in trouble with Parasharam because of that. That's another story. But, but the reason it, that the bow broke, actually the bow voluntarily broke. I don't know if any of you know this story. The bow decided to break on its own. And the reason for that is because Rama didn't want to break the bow. But the bow wanted to break because the bow understood that later on there would be a fight between Ravana and Ram and Ravana had the weapons of Lord Shiva. So he understood he didn't want to be used against Ram. So he broke, broke voluntarily. This is, the Acharyas talk about that. I don't know if any of you heard that story before. Anyway, the bow broke voluntarily. So uh, anyway, so, so then Sita and Ram got married. Then Ram went, was exiled to the forest by you know, his wonderful mother, Kaikei, you know, stepmother, Kaikei. And Dasarat didn't like the whole idea. And Sita just dutifully followed him into the forest. Such a chaste lady. Of course, even when they were in the forest, it's very, very interesting that uh, she carried all of her makeup with her and all of her jewelry. And, and she didn't carry it. Poor Lakshman had to carry it. <laughs> so poor Lakshman, he was carrying all this stuff. He didn't even eat the whole time they were in the forest. This poor guy, you know... <laughs> He had to do all the dirty work, you know, carry Sita's jewelry and makeup and build all the cottages and, you know, eventually try to put Sita into the fire. 
So he didn't want it to, he didn't want to be Ram's younger brother after that birth. And so Ram blessed him that he would always be the older brother after that. So he came back as Balaram later. <laughs> but Krishna is so funny that even though Krishna is the younger brother, he never listened to Balaram, the older brother. <laughs> Isn't it? He didn't. Krishna doesn't follow etiquette properly. <laughs> you know, if you've got to pick an example for your life, don't follow Krishna's example. Krishna is a horrible example, isn't it? He's, a, you know, he's the worst example of what you should do. But Ram is a good example. Actually, Ram is the, Ram is the idea. That's why people in India, they always talk about Ram. They never, never talk about Krishna Raj, isn't it? They never talk about... Krishna being the king, or they want a king like Krishna. They want a king like Ram. Of course, what they get is kings like Ravana or prime ministers that are not, maybe not bad as Ravana, but, you know, getting there. So, uh, anyway, so, so Sita followed dutifully into the forest. She was later, not kidnapped, but she was taken by Agni, and Maya Sita, as I mentioned before, was the actual one who was kidnapped. Later on, Maya Sita was brought back, Maya Sita entered the fire, the real Sita came out. And then what happened is after they went back to Ayodhya, there was this washerman, Dobiwala. <laughs> Dobiwala was a washerman. And he was complaining about his wife, because his wife, you know, went out for a few extra minutes. And uh, he said, you know, get out of here, you stupid wife. I mean, you can't do that nowadays, actually. <laughs> Just because your wife goes to the wellspring or something like that comes back an hour later, <laughs> you can't reject her. So anyway, so so he said, I'm not, I, I'm not like this Lord Ram, you know, henpecked Lord Ram. And, and when Lord Ram heard this, he actually thought, well, to rule the kingdom properly, to have the trust of the citizens, you know, Sita can't be there. Even Lord Ram was very, he loved Sita, but he thought the highest duty of a king is the duty to his citizens higher than the duty to the family, which is really interesting. When one takes the position of king, then the uh, primary, first priority, the duty to the citizens, and you have to relinquish your own personal happiness. That's interesting. A king or a leader in some other respect actually has that particular duty. Because we don't find that with modern day leaders. I mean, they actually not only are considering their own personal happiness more important, but they're actually stealing from the kingdom and putting money in Swiss bank accounts, right? Anyway, so uh, so Ram uh, asked Lachman to drop Sita off in the forest. She didn't know what was going on. You know, they went into the forest, and she thought they were just going for some pilgrimage, you know, just to have a good old picnic in the forest. She was also pregnant at the time, and Lachman just said, you know, get off the chariot, you're staying here. Go to the ashram of Valmiki Muni, and he couldn't even look. He was crying, crying, crying. He's thinking, what kind of a brother do I have? You know, he, he exiles his wife, puts her in a fire. You know, this is too much for me. That's why I became very determined not to become the younger brother anymore in the future. He was really fried out by the whole time, by this whole thing. Of course, you know, this is a pastime. He's God, too, you know, we understand. So, anyway, so she lived in the ashram of Valmiki Muni. She was pregnant. And uh, the brahmacharis in the ashram of Valmiki Muni were pretty agitated because they thought, you know, here's this pregnant lady. You know, who knows? you know, who the man is and everything like that. You know, this Valmiki Mooney, he's too liberal. They didn't know it was actually Sita Devi. She was in disguise. They were thinking, this, you know, Guru Dev is so liberal. Sometimes I get accused like that too by disciples. They say, you're so liberal. Oh, you know, use your discrimination, Guru Dev. Anyway, so they, they were talking. <laughs> they were, it's true. Brahma, you know, brahmacharis tend to be conservative, hyper-conservatives. I remember when I was a young brahmacharis, was hyper-conservative, you know. It's horrible. <laughs> it was simply horrible in those days. But anyway, so the brahmacharis, they're talking behind the guru's back. And then Valmiki, he sort of heard this and he thought, well, I've got to do something to prove her chastity. You know, so these brahmacharis will shut their mouths, you know, because they're committing offenses. He was concerned. So he said, all right, we have a lake here. The lake here is called the Shibi Shagara Lake. And the reason it's called the Shibi Shagara Lake was that once upon a time there were two birds, Shibi birds, anyway, and uh, like pigeons or something like that. And 
there was a male bird and a female bird. And the male bird was waiting for his wife one day to come back, flying back. And she came back late. And the male bird said to the female bird, hey, you're not chased. You know, you come back late, who knows what you've been doing. And the female bird, the female bird said, hey, hey buddy, we're birds. <laughs> you, know, birds you know, birds don't have some scars, you know, don't get married, you know, there's no fire sacrifice, you know. And he said, yes, I understand that, but we're in an ashram, so we're supposed to be dharmic birds. <laughs> And she said, well, anyway, I was Chase. I didn't run around with any other birds. <laughs> it's a funny story, actually, because uh, even the birds could talk. And so he said, prove it. I want you to fly over this whole lake, which was like 800 miles long or something like that, without falling in the water. You know, a little pigeon doing that, impossible. So this uh, female pigeon, she began to fly, and she started to drop down to the water, but prayed to the demigods, the demigods helped her fly all over the lake. Interesting story. You ever hear that story before? That's a famous story in the Ramaya. It should be a Shagora story. So then Valmiki said to Sita, all right, you've got to do the same thing. You know, if you're actually chased, you won't get wet. You, you can fly over this whole lake. So Sita Devi said, you know, if I'm actually chased, never uh, thought of anyone else but Lord Ram, let me just fly over the whole lake. And she did. She flew over the whole lake, didn't get wet. And then the brahmacharis had to shut up then. He said, Valmiki Muni said to the brahmacharis, you see, you rascals? Just shut your mouths. And so they said, yes, Gurudev. So sometimes the Gurudev has to prove things to them. Anyway, so after that, uh, she gave birth to Love and Kush, you know, the twin boys, the sons of Lord Ramchandra. We all know that story. They came and recited the Ramayana, which had been recited by Valmiki to, uh, to uh, Lord Rama, and Lachman in the kingdom. And eventually, uh, there was some desire to bring Sita Devi back uh, to the kingdom. And Valmiki Muni came and he said to Lord Ram, he said, I attest to the chastity of Sita Devi. There's no doubt about it. And Lord Ram said, I accept everything you say, but I want Sita Devi herself to vow to her chastity, you know. I accept, I mean, I don't have any doubts in Sita Devi, but look at all these people here, you know, they're a bunch of rumor-mongering people. That's the problem with a bunch of shooters, isn't it? They just like, boop, 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 talk. Just like you go on the internet nowadays, what happens? There's all sorts of criticism of Vaishnavas, isn't it, on the internet? Ever been on the internet? There's even a, a, a web page called the Vaishnava Ninda Network. You know what Ninda means? Offense. Vaishnava of a Ninda network. VNN. So they, their whole business is to commit offenses against Vaishnavas. If you join conferences, then everybody is going around criticizing Vaishnavas. Not everybody. A lot of people criticize Vaishnavas. That's why I'm not a member of any of these ridiculous conferences. You know, the name of so-and-so so disciple conference, they're actually just like jumping on different Vaishnavas' backs and trying to find fault with them rather than just talking to the Vaishnava personally and just finding out you know, why they did something. People are becoming discouraged or even driven out of the movement because of this. So uh, anyway, so Rama said Sita Devi is going to have to test it to herself. But Sita Devi said, well, I'm going to prove it for you. She said, you know, if I have always been chased, never thought of anyone even for one billionth of a second other than Lord Rama, let Mother Earth come and take me away from this place. You know, I've had it. It's too much, isn't it? Isn't it? It's too much. You know, this is, you know, I love Ram, but, you know, living in this world is just like a disaster area. And so the earth opened up like that. Uh, Bumi came out. She said, you know, my dear daughter, come with me. You don't belong here anymore. They don't appreciate you. And then they took Sita Devi away and that was it. That was the end of Sita Devi's pastimes. But the actual story explained by the Acharyas is that Sita Devi, she didn't leave because she was frustrated. In the movie it seems like that. But she actually left because she understood to serve Lord Ram to prove her chastity, that was the only thing that people would accept. You understand? They wouldn't accept her saying she was chaste. The only thing they would accept was some supernatural phenomena like the earth opening up. Interesting, isn't it? 
Okay, so that's the story about the Sita Devi. And then, I don't know if we have...